mantra, the change starts here. This is the insight that guides its orientation to serving the community. And in my mind, it's a profound statement, one we ought to take a moment to ponder. It signals so much potential. Look around. The people in the room, this place, this moment, the United Way is telling us that we have the potential to address social ills in our community and make our province a better place. If we make such decisions, they have the potential to be what history books write about. Movies will be screened. Songs may yet be sung, and I wonder what songs will people sing about the decisions we make with respect to change today. Practicing what it preaches, the United Way has actually undergone over the last five to six years a significant internal review of how it contributes to change. It's moved from being a federated funder to a group that strategically thinks about how does it drive change to support priority populations. You've already heard, vulnerable seniors and families with children. And they bring to this orientation a very pragmatic approach. On one hand, they look to individuals who are struggling right now and say, how can we deliver relief? How can we invest in innovative community services to support people in this moment? That's one way in which change starts here and now. But as an academic at UBC interested in the determinants of health, I have to say I'm also immensely attracted to the prevention-oriented focus that the United Way takes. It's looking where are the root causes of some of our broader problems, and how do we change and work with communities to change our decision-making environment to address those determinants of health, to make them better over time, because that's where fundamental social change takes place. Interestingly, I would argue at UBC, change starts here. It really is an apt way of summarizing how we have evolved in our strategic thinking. I think one of the most important things President Toop has done under his tenure as our leader is he has elevated community engagement to a key pillar side by side with teaching excellence and research excellence. In our Place and Promise strategic plan, we now say explicitly that the university exists for the communities it serves, local, provincial, national, and global. As a result, it dedicates university resources to public understanding of social issues and to stimulating action for positive change. Clearly, there is a direct overlap between what UBC is wanting to do and what the United Way has been working year after year after year in our community to achieve. And that collaboration is an important one that you represent the cutting edge of, both as donors and as staff and faculty here at our university. When the United Way reports that 30 plus percent of kids are vulnerable when they come to school, they're reporting UBC research. When they report that 40% of kids aged in grade four to grade seven experience bullying, they are reporting UBC research. So UBC is turning to our community to help identify the priorities, the needs that exist across our province. But at the same time, the United Way then serves our needs. It convenes audiences, not often at UBC, but generally out there in the community, getting local stakeholders to hear our research. And by convening them, it validates the importance of what we are doing here. And more than that, it mobilizes people to act in response. And that means the United Way is a key partner in our own UBC knowledge translation goals. And I would argue that never before has that collaboration been more important, especially with respect to the priority area of families with young children. Because research from our institution is showing increasingly that in our country, compared to the 1970s, it has become harder to raise a family. The generation raising young kids is experiencing a substantial decline in the standard of living. Let me tell you a simple then and now story to make that clear. Picture it. The mid-1970s, baby boomers were emerging from their sex, drugs, and rock and roll phase to start the more serious business of building homes and communities and enterprises. And think back, if I were to adjust for inflation and tell you in today's dollars what the average household income was for a young couple, across the country, it was about $66,000. If you flash forward to today, do you think that average household income is up or down or about the same? Actually, it's about the same. Adjusting for inflation, it's about $68,000. In BC, actually, it's dropped, but that's a sad story, so we're going to keep it national. 
<laughs> Think, though, about who is contributing to household incomes today compared to the mid-1970s. In the mid-1970s, just over half of Canadian women, young women, were contributing employment income to that household income. Today, it's over 80%. That's a heck of a lot more adult time devoted to contributing household income, and yet we're seeing that that income is stalled. And now look at the primary cost of living. Oops, the primary cost of living. Housing. Housing has increased across our country 76% in real terms after adjusting for inflation. In BC, 149%, and I'm too scared to tell you what the fact is, in Vancouver. <laughs> we, as a result, over the last several decades have now come to witness a generation raising young kids who are squeezed. They are squeezed for time at home, they are squeezed for income even when they are not poor because the cost of housing, and they are squeezed for services like childcare that would help them balance their earning and caregiving responsibilities. Do you want to know why 30% of BC kids come to school in kindergarten vulnerable and most of them don't live in poor households or poor neighborhoods? It's because of that squeeze. That squeeze is occurring even though the Canadian economy between 1976 and today has doubled in size after controlling for inflation. It now produces $35,000 more per household on average. And yet that squeeze reflects the generation raising young kids does not experience that additional prosperity. In many respects, when I'm feeling a bit edgy, I would argue that the generation raising young kids is getting a bad deal. Certainly, the um, UNICEF and other international organizations confirm that in terms of policy, the generation raising young kids in Canada does get a bad deal. We are ranked at the very bottom of industrialized countries when it comes to investing in policy to support kids, with, for kids support families with kids under age six. Ranked at the bottom. That ranking is not consistent with our proud tradition. It'd be lovely if we got rid of that. Of building and adapting. Building and adapting in response to the dynamic needs, the ever-changing needs of our socioeconomic environment. Think back, the late 1900s. We were building public schools and universities. We were building roads and railways. We were building markets and banks. We thought those achievements were so significant when sent people overseas to defend our values and protect our institutions. And when they came back in injured, we adapted again. We put in place things like uh, veterans and benefits. We thought that was so significant, we extended it to the labor market more generally. And then the busiest beavers in Canada's history, the parents of baby boomers, set out to put in place things like hospital insurance and old age security. And in one single year, 1966, that group of people launched our Medical Care Act and our Canada Public Pension Plan, which remain the two most important contributions we make to one another socially as citizens. This is a history we can be proud of, which surely is one that I am proud of. But it begs an important question. What have we done since? And I like to leave a pregnant pause. Let people ponder that, feel a little bit edgy, squirm in our chairs. Without doubt, we've built more bridges and uh, roads perhaps not enough transit. We have continued to strengthen our markets with, through free trade and we have definitely strong banks that we take pride in because we've weathered the recession better than most countries. But on the social side, in terms of programming, r my research and other research shows that our history books are increasingly empty when it comes to describing what we have done since. And for me, this begs a wee bit of an intergenerational tension. <laughs> And when I'm in my most provocative, definitely with my UBC hat on, I'm not my United Way hat on, I will ask questions like, is it the case that adults who came of age in the 1970s bored more from their kids than did previous generations? And I like to be edgy that way, because the data, regrettably, gives some reason to say yes. Sure, the economy doubled in size over the last generation, but the public debt tripled. And that's just the fiscal debt we leave for the future to take on. Then think about our environmental debt. Between 1976 and today, Canadians have not decreased our per capita carbon dioxide emissions. And yet many countries, industrialized countries, those that had lower carbon footprints than we did in 1976, have reduced their footprints still further, some of them leaving us in their dust. And as those public debts grow, there are some interesting private uh, income and wealth dynamics playing on in our, in our country and in our province. For those who lucked out coming of age in the 1970s in a 
real estate market that increased over time by 76% across the country, 150% in our province. Housing has become a major source of wealth as people set into retirement, allowing them to transform our expectations for a retirement such that globe trotting and a second home over there are more and more achievable realities. And yet housing represents, for those coming of age as adults now, starting out with young families, represents the primary source of debt. Saddling the very group of people who need to invest in the economy and invest in the pensions and health care to sustain our aging population. And saddling the very group of people who must invest in our country's future, their children. When we see these kinds of intergenerational dynamics, as a researcher, it makes me want to say, what kind of country do we want? What is the Canada on which we are standing on guard, or for which we are standing on guard? And then I put my United Way hat back on, because I think it uniquely manages to get, show us a path to address this tension. What are the priority groups that United Way wishes to address? Well, on the one hand, it's let's support vulnerable seniors. We have a strong tradition of doing so. Indeed, in Canada, between 1976 and today, we have reduced poverty for seniors from 29% down to 5%. That's an amazing achievement. It still means there's a group of seniors that we continue to have to focus on and support, and and as our population ages and isolation grows and dependency changes, we need to address that. And the United Way is at the cutting edge of doing so in our communities. But by the same token, the United Way is saying we also need to think very systematically about the other end of the life course, families raising young kids. And they do so, as I said, pragmatically. They right now are saying, how do we provide support to the 30% of kids who are vulnerable starting school, the 40% of kids in school suffering from bullying? And then how do we think about foundational change? Change that will persist so that these problems don't continue to grow into the future. And they think about how can we urge our population to move from this bad deal to a new deal for the generation raising young kids. Now that is the kind of social change that the United Way is committed to, that the Uni University of British Columbia is committed to through Place and Promise. Such change can and ought to start here and now. And you in this room have been at the cutting edge for some time. As staff and faculty contributing to our Place and Promise goals, and many of you as donors, some who have given $1,000 or more in the past year to the United Way. Let's continue to dig deep to ensure that our collaboration strengthens moving forward and so that we do address these problems for these priority populations. Thank you so much.